Oh, wait, let me put your name up here, too, so people know who you are right here. Oh, we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Welcome to another live stream. I am here with... Hi. Oh, you got to remember which way to go, because it's opposite. Yeah. You want to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the opposite. So, Pat, down in uh, Australia, down under, and uh, what time is it there? Uh, it's quarter past nine in the morning. Oh, we got another Australian right here joining us. James Maturana says, hey, boys, nine in the morning. Good morning to you, fine, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's, been a, it's been a couple of months back and forth getting it going. Yeah, I think this is the first one I've done in 2020, dude. Yeah, right. I think. I'm pretty sure it is. But uh, because I've been busy, we've been chatting about things that have been going on in my life. Got to love growing older and and mm -hmm. uh what that entails and and um you know it's it's just part of life and we we experience it in a in a accelerated manner with our dogs and uh yeah for sure you know so we have a lot of people joining us we got ken cunningham says hey uh josh wiggins you josh had you down at his uh, facility yep. how did that the go beautiful facility in texas yeah, yeah one of the nicest places i've ever been to i keep telling him that it's one. I want to get one of those walk behind floor cleaners that he's got, man. I'm kind of yeah, I'm yeah, the of, Zamboni. Yeah, I'm I'm scoping yeah. one out, man. I can't wait to tag him when I get one. Uh, yeah. Yours says, "Look at those beards." And I uh, just uh, took a big chunk off mine yesterday. I understand. This is pretty intimidating. <laughs> next to so, uh, yeah, I didn't want to come on your show and and out beard you. So I've, oh, I've you would a, not out beard me. I've, I've <laughs> taken a position. <laughs> I've taken a position of submission against you. Uh, I'm, I'm showing that I'm no threat. <laughs> <Good boy. laughs> You're not a threat, man. You're good. Uh, you know, I met Pat a couple of years ago. We met in Florida and then mm -hmm. I saw him again last year in Colorado and we met at the IACP conference. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you, you guys have won an award this year or this. Last yeah. Year. Yep. Sure did. Yeah. It's uh, might be here somewhere. It's definitely in this room. Uh, anyway, yeah, just an appreciation of the IACP. Um, yeah, we 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 did a lot of work sort of promoting them. And, you know, there was some turbulence, some people putting out some content about them during the year. And uh, me and Glenn on our on our podcast at Canon Paradigm um, did what we could to try and stifle that and keep people calm. Good. And I think they, they, they appreciated that. And also we're working pretty hard. Like we've, you know, I think there's a lot of different dog organizations. There's a lot of different ones that people have the opportunity to join. Um, but I think, you know, divided will fall. And, you know, so we've chosen ISCP. I think it's a good one. Um, it's probably the one that uh, aligns with our values and ethos the most. And we're doing everything we can to try and push people towards that, to grow the organization, because I think it's really important that we do have a, a really strong professional organization. Um uh, representing us in the industry so yeah we're we're big supporters of it and uh and in turn they've, they've been big supporters of ours which is great and glenn's um glenn stepped up and is on the board now so that's for a guy who needs more work like he needs a hole in the head he's taken on a pretty big role so so yeah i mean good for him and and, and it's important that people like him do do that because he's really good you know he's not just good on the tools with the dogs but he's very very good at the business side of things and managing a board and leadership and all that kind of stuff so that's that's the kind of thing that we need in is to remember that just because someone's a great dog trainer doesn't necessarily mean they're a great board person right um but i think he is the right person for that job or, or a good person for that job well and speaking of board people i have k canine cohen yeah dog training who was just elected to the president of the of the IACP. So congratulations, Jason and and Glenn for your positions and, and great people. Yeah. You know, I remember Jason was totally. advertising. So he 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 knows how to uh influence people and and that's what we yeah, need. Yeah, so he's running the marketing stuff and yeah, that's a great idea and pushing it out because that's what we need is good marketing. Um we need to grow membership and so you need people that know what they're doing in that and not like here's the odd Facebook post here and then, right? So what Jason's doing is fantastic. Yeah. Well I mean and it's hard. I mean to to juggle a large amount of people in an industry where a lot of this stuff is like I don't know if that feels esoteric to people, I guess, like they're guarding knowledge or intuitive and they're, they're being vulnerable too. And, and, um, 
yeah, it's just an interesting thing. Interspecies communication in itself, <laughs> mm. you know, what, what we're all paid to do and to give advice on uh, yeah. such an interesting concept. Yeah, it really comes down to clarity. I think the more um, clear you can be with the dog, no, or no matter what, when you're talking interspecies communication is clarity and consistency is, is what gets you over the line. Yeah. Absolutely. Clarity, consistency. And I tell people, you know, repetition is the mother of learning. You know, yeah. we all are all, you know, living creatures on this plane of existence, earth, experiencing life, however, wherever we came from. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we all possess these different body parts and to, to have a, a firm understanding of those functions and then how our our body parts kind of differ from them, you know, especially with our neocortex, our prefrontal cortex, our ability to discern to contemplate, you know, all this stuff. Uh, it's kind mm -hmm. of our obligation to understand these animals in a way that will benefit their lives, I believe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Does that make sense? So what else is new, bro? <laughs> Nothing, man, here. Let me say, we got a lot of people joining us and I haven't even shared it yet. So these are people are all off of my Bow Wow Bill page. So it just makes me so nice. happy to see nice. people uh, picking up on this and, and joining us. We have Drew. And if you guys have not seen Drew, this lady does these watercolors and she is so talented. Uh, I cannot recommend her highly enough. And thank you, Drew. I will treasure uh, the painting of my boy that you've given me. I put up a link to the canineprofessionals.com. If anybody wants information, if you work with with dogs, uh, nice. they handle, I mean, dog training, dog grooming, dog walkers, uh, pet sitters, all that stuff. I mean, it's just a great organization to belong to. Um, and we got Jason, my man. Joining there is. right now. Hey, Jason, by the way, when I started a war on Facebook over putting my little skipper key on the uh, the table in front of me, <laughs> did you see that, Pat? I did. I scrolled <laughs> by. Yeah, I'd stroll, just I saw it by. exploding and I just uh, chose to keep scrolling. And, and then, you know, it was basically to tell everybody this was like a situation art. We had mechanical failures on the night before. And then we were waiting forever for this new plane that didn't show up. So they paid for all of our hotels. And then they called us early to tell us that they got a plane. And there was like six of us on this plane. And it was like totally, you know, not out of the regular. So I, it's something that uh -huh. I, I, you put your dog on the tray table. Yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I don't, uh, whatever. Let's, let's move on. We got Larry Crone joining us. <laughs> Well, oh, what I was going to say is, Jason, I was wearing this shirt. <laughs> yeah, right. You're just giving him some some bad yeah. publicity. Yeah, just you're welcome, buddy. So if anybody calls you uh, talking about being on the plane with the dog, uh, hope it's good and hope you gain some, <laughs> some, <laughs> some, some clients from that, buddy. If not, then sorry about that. Nelson, my man, do you know Nelson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How Have you, you been new? Um been to any of his stuff any of the seminars no i haven't no i've never had the opportunity no highly recommend it dude you know this is yeah, right. more about I, I always tell people become the dog by proxy a lot of people they make the mistake of anthropomorphizing the animal right mm -hmm. or putting human characteristics on that animal mm -hmm. uh, where nelson would be the perfect guy i would send people to to understand that dog on a deeper level and mm -hmm. uh, see the world through that dog's eyes yeah right Larry Crone says he loves his body parts. Did you see his little live stream about how he's talking about getting fat and his belly yeah. was growing every winter? He grows his he grows fat and then summer he works it off. And he's like, oh, I feel you, Larry. I feel you. That's 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 basically the cycle of my life. That's me, too. Right now, dude, I'm on the fat. But I can see my wheelie down here. And that's what he was talking about. He eats until he can't see it. <laughs> and then he works out and then, he'll, and then he looks down he's like hey there little buddy or hey there buddy i don't know <laughs> whatever oh god yeah that's a benchmark <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that that's a benchmark for sure yeah you want to stop there even though my yeah. dad said if you have a good tool you want to build a shed over it you know <laughs> <laughs> oh good uh, pat thank you for love and support time you give to the iacp you Pleasure. guys share this share this if you see this and then uh I saw that too. So, uh, and Glenn's on with us too. We were just chatting with you, mm -hmm. Glenn, about you, Glenn. And I hope to be chatting with you on one of these live streams as well. You uh, know, I've stood Glenn up. This is uh, me and Glenn's normal recording time, Tuesday morning, nine o'clock. That's when we usually record our show, but uh, we're here instead. You're with me. 
Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind, Glenn. I hope you're not a jealous guy. We organize for later in the week. Okay. We'll get it done. <laughs> Good. So um, when did you start working with dogs, Pat? Uh, mate, I started in dogs, like taking it really seriously in probably about 2011. Um, before that, I like, so I was in the army. Um, I was in a, a special forces unit here in Australia called two commando regiment. And, uh, I think it was 2008. I was deployed. I was in Afghanistan. I was embedded with, a, uh, I was embedded with the Afghan army and kind of long story short, uh, I saw a coalition force dog and my unit didn't have dogs at the time. Okay. Uh, and I saw another military working dog for the first time. Um, and I saw my first live bite and I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Um, and, uh, what I didn't know at the time, you know, that what I didn't, it took me a long time to understand that that dog still to this day is one of the best military working dogs I've ever seen. Um, the handler was like, had a fantastic relationship and control with that dog. Right. And the dog wasn't trained by him. So I didn't really fully understand all that at the time. And so this guy gave me this completely false uh, representation of what it was like to live with and own a dog like that. Um, and so uh, when I got back to Australia, I, I had this really old border collie, so old dog named Ernie. He was my wife's dog. Um, and so I, he was, he, you know, he could barely walk at this stage. So I got really into the idea of dog training, uh, but had no dog. Um, and I kind of talk about this all the time because it, it sort of gives a history, like a glimpse into the way I train dogs now is that, uh, I, and I still feel pretty strongly about this. Uh, I was researching everything and, and Facebook, you know, this is 2008, nine Facebook wasn't what it is now. And YouTube wasn't either. Right. Like they were there, but they were not the beast that they are now with the availability to content and people and that sort of thing. Right. So I was reading a lot of books and I was downloading what I could and getting amongst it. And, and I still feel pretty strongly about this, that I think if you've got a group of people over here who say, um, you know, positive reinforcement training is all you need. Um, there's absolutely no need for any tools, any corrections, anything, whatever, and you can get uh, fantastic results. And then you've got another group of people, where's my hand, who say, no, you do need to use tools and pressure and that sort of stuff and to get those results. Well, when you have no evidence of either, right, like when you're just reading a book, right, and there's no, you can't see anything, um, and I didn't have a dog to practice on, I still feel pretty strongly that I think you're an asshole if you decide, no, I want to go with the team that is okay with causing pain and pressure and that sort of thing. Uh, hold on. Dog shows, right? Hold on one second. Go ahead and keep going. You're right. I guess this is the beauty of lives, especially in a house full of dogs. I think Bill told me before he has 57 dogs in his house at the moment. Might have been 107, I can't remember. Wendy likes my t-shirt. Thanks. I'm all I'm all backwards by the um, the camera here. Um, hopefully my dog doesn't also erupt, but he's asleep on the couch behind me, so I doubt it. I feel kind of like um, when Joe Rogan has guests on and they go to the bathroom, and he has to just kind of fill dead space. <laughs> At least he has Jamie to talk to. Oh my god! I was just telling everyone. I was just telling everyone, Bill, how you have fifty-seven dogs in your house at the moment. Dude, I got a hound dog. That's that's it. That's all you need, man. This guy sets everybody off, and we have this guy that just pulled up. He's like a, um, uh, I don't know, a collector or something. He saw one of my neighbor's vehicles and wanted to know if i wanted to sell it and i'm like oh god i said no. yeah absolutely give me 500 bucks it's yours no <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's um, uh, that's the joy yeah so anyway echo was saying mate i think uh, i didn't have a dog to practice on it and i i ended up becoming a pretty staunch force free trainer uh in theory with no actual dog to practice on and then you know again long story short when i eventually my my old dog died and i got a, a malinois um, and didn't get it from a great place. And, you know, it, I wasn't set up for success. It wasn't, it didn't take too long before I was like, oh, hang on. Uh, I still remember sitting on the couch with my wife and going, you know what? I'm starting to see the holes in this positive only thing. <laughs> and she was like, oh, thank God. Finally, you've come around to it. Um, but yeah, so then after that, once I had a dog and, you know, was in a position where I'd bitten off way more than I could chew, that's when I started taking dog training really seriously. And that was probably about 2011. Um, and from there, it's been a snowball ever since. 
you know, there's a, there's a commonality who who have uh, who's ever watched these live stream that I've done with many different people uh, mm-hmm. of exactly what you're saying right now. Pat is like, I I did it until it didn't work anymore. Yeah, and I found I, I I had to find what worked. Yeah, I was in the same boat, man. I was the same way. You know, I learned, but then I watched pretty pretty um, over the top dominant um alpha roles or whatever you want to call it um Mm -hmm. in the early 80s when i first started working with dogs and so i was like i do not want to do that right um and then i just noticed things that uh we that we 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 talk about it's called competing motivators right Mm -hmm. and uh they they find out something that they want to do much more than this treat and then sometimes when you're just a, a treat dispenser you're you're looked at as a sucker with with some of these breeds right um, yeah. Well, and so that's the thing, like I, I sort of, uh, I would like to go back to, you know, that, that early dog, I would love to be able to revisit that and knowing what I know now about effective use of positive reinforcement and see mm-hmm. how much more gains I could make, because it's not to say that like using pressure and tools is the be all and end all and that a dog can't be trained without it. That That's not, I, I don't believe that's the case. There, there's certainly, there's reliability pieces and, and certain dogs need certain things. But as you say, it's those competing motivators, right? And this dog that I had was um, kind of nervy, and I, I probably didn't understand that at the time, and was very, very aggressive. Like, was actually a very, very dangerous dog. Um, and you know, I got to the limit of what I could do using positive reinforcement, and I taught him a lot of cool stuff. He could do a lot of amazing things. Um, but what I, I couldn't, there, I couldn't put enough value into those things that he would not be aggressive towards people, right? When the conditions like meant that he would and i'm curious like i'd like to you know i would like an opportunity at that dog again it's never going to happen but knowing what i know now about better use of positive reinforcement because you know as i've grown as a trainer i've gotten better at everything so i'm better at u- using the the you know the the carrot and the and the stick right um mm-hmm. so it's not to say uh what i was doing was wrong i just think i, I feel like i definitely could have could do it better now definitely and, and use those motivators more precisely and use negative punishment better that i didn't you know i full, didn't fully understand back then and probably didn't use as well as i, I certainly could have um but then also um you know use tools in a different way because that dog was a really you know his training was popo nay um and you know for like anybody that's listened to my stuff and 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 probably you know with all the people you've had on as well we've i've come around to that knee popo and front loading the pressure and what i could do with that dog once i became a balanced trainer right was for sure i could he could do a bunch of cool tricks he could do a bunch of cool things truth be told that dog had better obedience than my current dog um just because i cared about it more like i was more interested in um the IPO type, you know, head up, prancy heel. And he could do that. My current dog heels like a thug, right? Like he, um, cause it's just the points aren't there in the game that I play. Um, but so he, he could do a lot of cool stuff. And then once I brought in the tools and the pressure, I could stop him doing stuff, no problem. And, but then what I had trouble was, was getting him to do the things that he knew how to do taught with positive reinforcement. Um, by using pressure to get those things to happen and, and have them ha- happen flashy, motivated, powerful. What would um, happen so, instead? Yeah, well, so what, what ended up happening, what I now understand is that, like, I, I just recently put out a big video on our Patreon about this. Like, I, I, I sort of don't think that dogs interpret punishment as much as we intend to deliver it. I think more often than not, the, the tools of pressure that we use on these dogs are for an alternate behavior that appears as though it's punishing. So, like take that dog for example right like he would bark lunge growl at everybody he met right he wanted to kill everybody he met um and you know via the use of a prong collar i i i thought that i had extinguished that behavior Mm. and so you know he would not do that when presented with a stimulus that in the past would have you know caused that big reaction that big show he would stop he would not do it but then when i asked him to sit down stand whatever and he didn't do it at that point i go yeah okay i'm a balanced trainer i like it's fair for me to give a correction but if i applied pressure via the prong collar he came into like a loose leash heel right like he just right. came into that position right. and it like what i understand now and certainly understood sort of at the end of his life was that uh the pressure that i was using to stop that behavior was actually a negative reinforcement into an alternate behavior right so you can't loose leash walk and be at the end of the lead trying to kill someone 
And so he only understood pressure into that context. So then everything else I taught him was positive reinforcement, right? Like, right. you know, because I wanted the flashy, like I say, he had great obedience, really flashy, powerful looking obedience. But if something went wrong and I go, okay, here's pressure to bring on like uh, compliance, it didn't bring compliance. It brought the alternate behavior that he'd been taught with a learning phase of pressure. And so I think that's kind of the modern evolution of dog training is that we have a lot of people who are a lot of pressure, you know, train with a lot of pressure and their dogs often look like shit. And they're, they're very compliant dogs. The dogs do what they're told, but the dogs, you know, look like they're begging to live with anybody else. <laughs> and we have, we have a bunch of people who train with positive reinforcement and you can split them in half again. You could say like these are the force-free people who'd never layer in the pressure. And then there's people who like, oh, I train everything with positive reinforcement, but then if the dog gets it wrong, I'm okay to use pressure. But none of those really fit to bring on the flashy, motivated, powerful behavior that you can guarantee will happen. And if the dog for some reason says, no, I'm not going to do it, then you can say, yeah, you are. Like you, And the dog goes, okay, yeah, I am. Right? Yeah. And he happily does it, right? My bad. And I think that's, yeah, that's it, right? That's the modern edge. That's the modern um, cutting edge of dog training at the moment. That's where people need to understand. And that's what I'm, you know, really uh, endeavoring to teach as I'm traveling the world trying to teach this to people right. is that that picture of like the flashy, motivated, powerful dog who does things with like with the image of having chosen to do it himself, but also is has to do it whether he chooses to or not. Um, and even the, just saying that can upset some people, right? But I think that the truth is, uh, you know, my passion still lies in the, the the powerful dogs, the dangerous dogs, the the dogs with jobs, right? That's where I like to work. And truth is, these dogs have to do their job sometime, right? Like, yeah, you, somebody's people... life li lies on the line. You know, whether, that's whether right, it's a right. dog or a protection dog, a detection dog, where there, there's an explosive yeah. there. I mean, these yeah, things, exactly. Those, and, we rely and, on. Them. You know, one of them, like. Like the autistic kid, you know, goes goes for his walk and and no one knows where he is. And the dog then has to track him. And it's like, hey, we can't we can't afford to say, oh, the dog's not hungry. We'll wait till he's more hungry. Like at that point, you know, if the dog if the dog isn't in the mood for tracking, but he's the dog we have, we have to at that point be able to say, Hey, you, your job is to track. You you have to track. And the the truth is like a dog, dogs can fake tracking, right? So you, the way that you train that has to be taught in a way where he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do it, right? Like I, I wasn't quite in the mood for it, but now you've told me I have to, I, I absolutely am in the mood for it and I'm going to do it as though I had willingly done it the first time anyway. And that's the magic of modern dog training is being able to do that where the dog is like always happy, motivated to work. Of course, a day comes where he says he's not going to, and you can at that point say you have to, and he goes, cool, got it. Let's yeah. go to work. Well, I think that's also twofold as far as how dog training works, because not only do you have to be able to train a dog, but you have to be able to read that dog. Because I totally. see people, people that, that put up these videos of dogs and I'm like, whoa. Yeah. You know, and it's, and that's what we're talking about when we say flattened out dogs, dogs that yeah. they're complying, but well, like you said, they, they're, they'd rather be with somebody else. Um, yeah. Or, or I think reading a dog is a skill, right? Because like I think about when I first started in this, uh, I don't really have any natural talent as a dog trainer. I had to learn everything that I did. And and I, I I shudder to think the things I used to explain that my dog was doing, like, you know, I was, you know, I was like every pet dog owner. Oh, he's protecting me and all this bullshit, that, these stories that you tell yourself. Um, and it wasn't for me. I really thought that. And I could, I didn't know how to read a dog. And, and I think some of the best dog trainers amongst us are the people who can intuitively read a dog, mm -hmm. um, are just born knowing how to do it. But overwhelmingly, people are not born just knowing how to do it, right? It takes a lot of time, effort, energy, and and really, uh, as well as it can be a little bit subjective as to what do you think is a good looking dog, right? So like, we can look at uh, a picture of a dog, and it we can all determine like, yeah, that dog looks happy, or that dog looks like he shut down or whatever. But then it's up to the individual to decide that dog looks like a dog I want that's how I want a dog to look, right? right? Because that's so, that's subjective. Everybody wants their dogs to look and feel particular yeah. ways. But I think for the average person who, you know, knows dogs and um, wants their dog to be happy, once you really understand that and you go, oh shit, like he's not calm, he's shut down. He's, he's not, um, he's not, a, you know, he's, he's not, not protecting me. He's stressed the fuck out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, and that's what we all face as dog as you know, dealing with pet dog owners. That's the big one, right? Oh, the dog's protecting me. I'm like, <laughs> I promise you that dog ain't protecting you. I promise you. When the yeah. attack comes, he's going to turn on you. It, yeah. Like the only reason that you're, fair you're even a part of this picture is because you're holding the leash, yeah. right? And it can be really confronting. People don't want to accept that. And it, it doesn't fit the narrative of what we've all been told about dogs. So well, I think well, reading dog body language is such a skill and, and um, definitely something that more people in the industry need to teach. It's not. It's not something I teach, right? Um, uh, and I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Nelson Hodges. That, right? Nelson Hodges, man, that's the guy. Yeah, he's the guy, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, going back to him, he teaches you. You know, the different la levels of possessiveness that the dog has. He puts up slides and asks people, "Is this dog fighting or are they playing?" And mm -hmm. after you learn what you what you learn from him, it's very easy to discern oh, this dog's playing, this dog's fighting, and because mm -hmm. he talks about predator mindset. And um, just like what you were saying earlier about dogs not interpreting the way we intended to be delivered, that's huge. Because the number, like I was saying about people anthropomorphizing that dog, that plays into that because it's natural mm -hmm. for us to overlay our perceptions on something because it's, it makes it easier for us to digest it, right? It makes it easier for us to, to understand it. And in doing so, we misinterpret a lot of stuff and we mm -hmm. make excuses um, we label it with characteristics that aren't even possible for that dog um, that I hear, you know, from dogs being gay to being sad or, you know, there's lots of different things because they're anthropomorphized. It, you know, it's it's how the humans see that world. And yeah, that's a hard line. That's a that's a hard line to walk. Right. Because I think um, we don't know too much about what dogs really can think. Right. Like we know, like I. I, lately, a few years ago, I would 100% agree. I'd say, yeah, yeah, definitely. People over, uh, people are anthropomorphizing. Can never say that word too much, right? And they're they're putting way too much on their dogs. But I don't know. At the moment, I'm sort of coming around to the idea that I think there's a lot more going on than than really meets the eye. And the modern science is kind of proving a lot of that to us, right? Um, yeah. That there really is a lot of emotions that are going on within the dog. Um, and like I had, I, I saw a big Facebook argument, which I, you know, has a I, I don't get involved in any, but I saw someone complaining about there's no way a dog can possibly feel jealousy. That Like that was the statement. There's absolutely no way a dog is capable of the complex feeling of jealousy. What a dog can feel is uh, like an anger or be, uh, what were the exact words? But it was something over a loss of rights of access. And I just thought that's the best definition of jealousy I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, maybe, uh, maybe they can't be jealous, but that's just, yeah, they certainly can display all the emotions that look like that. Right. Or the, the, the characteristics, the, the, um, the body language, the actions that seem to accompany jealousy. So I don't know. I don't know. Like, um, uh, uh, Again, it's not my area of expertise, but I just think lately I'm starting to think that um, maybe I err on the side of like, yeah, he probably does feel like that. But then it then comes the piece of like actually knowing what you're talking about, right? Rather than just sort of saying like, uh, you know, like we always use that example and we've said it twice already that the dog's protecting me. Well, you know, then like certainly people could look like that, but if you can't read a dog and you don't understand why dogs are aggressive, then you wouldn't understand that he actually is not protecting you at all. He's protecting himself. Um, and that's where I think the average person gets it wrong. It's not necessarily that they misunderstand what a dog is capable of feeling. I think what they really do is misunderstand what the dog is actually feeling in this moment, right? Because of course there's, there are dogs that are totally capable of protecting people. Like, and that happens for sure. Um, but, uh, the average dog is not doing that. And, no. and it, you know, that's kind of drawing the distinction. So is it, is it possible to say like, yeah, your dog will, the dog will protect his owner from a threat. hundred percent that, 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 that happens on the daily by dogs who have the capacity to do that, the, the, the physical mental courage, as well as the training to, to display it. Um, but then also there's dogs that are just nerve bags freaking out and people are determined that like calling that the same thing. So I think it, it's much less what the dog is capable of feeling that is the problem. It's in our understanding of that. It's much more people misinterpreting what they're seeing. Yeah. That's my rant. 
Well, and that's it is, is, I mean, and, and even the, the feeling of protection is subjective. You know, what I feel yeah. when I feel protected might be not be, you know, up, up to par when you feel protected and mm-hmm. you know, it's a wobbly term. I just put in to uh, back up and reemphasize your point about how we're learning more and more. I put up a link to a PubMed article about functional fMRIs, functional magnetic yeah. resonance imaging of domesticated jo- dogs, a research methodology and conceptual issues and what we try to gain out of the, what we've learned from these um from from going in and looking at these there's basically an mri that can see the brain as it's having thoughts and they'll put uh you know different um pictures and stuff in front of the dog but now they have it even where they can put it on the dog out in the field um right pretty cool stuff and yeah uh, that's awesome you know i think that that yeah absolutely these dogs are capable of feeling um but it, but just like i was saying it's subjective and those dogs are individuals themselves you know yeah and that's important yeah totally to yeah and i think like just to carry on that same example the number of dogs that are likely to be protective of their owner rather than just fearful themselves and therefore displaying aggression like that's a narrow funnel man like they're they're the ones that are hard to find yeah, um, you better believe because and even then the, the deeper motivation of that is hard to understand as well. Like I, you know, I talk about um, minute to minute, second to second, your dog is just trying to better his own situation. That's it, right? And so I don't I like. There's no such thing as altruism, but I, I, I feel the same way about people as well, right? Like um, I've had people say, "Oh, my dog would take a bullet for me," and I say, "Like I don't doubt that he would, but he doesn't understand the repercussions of that. Like it doesn't. He will perform the the trained behavior." But he doesn't understand how consequence. guns work. He doesn't understand the concept of death. Like that, those things are beyond him. He, he can perform a, a trained behavior, and maybe you know, I had this actual argument with a guy whose dog did get shot um, and protected him. But I was like, what actually happened was the guy was the dog was going to bite the guy, and he got in the way of the gun like during that time. Um, and so there was no nothing altruistic about it. And I think, you know, this is where I am willing to entertain the argument, certainly not in dogs, but in people, I kind of don't believe in altruism either. I think that everybody is just trying to better their own situation as, again. And and I like to think that uh, given the – put in the situation, maybe I would take a bullet for my son, but I know for sure I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't, right? So really my, my motivation to do that is actually – from within it's from myself rather than uh, an altruistic sort of idea of protecting him well it's all about that um hierarchy of needs too and we're pretty much at the top of the pyramid right now and if things changed um we might see a different um actualization of the human uh condition huh (laughs) yeah yeah that's right well you've been in afghanistan man you've seen you know, you've been in special forces. You've seen, you know, some stuff that a lot of us have not and had experiences and knowledge through experience is a totally different ball game than, than just reading about it, um, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think, you know, through the experiences I had in the Army, um, certainly I got to know myself pretty well, you know. Um, certainly that, like, I, I think at, at this, you know, I turned 37 in a couple of months or weeks or whatever. Um, yeah. But I think I'll be surprised if I learn too much more about myself as life goes on, right? Like oh I've my had God, some, just I've, you wait, dude. <laughs> well, learn, like, I've had some pretty deep moments of self-reflection throughout my time, you know? And yeah. I think that um, uh, what people do and what they're capable of is uh, quite extraordinary given the circumstances um, that they're in, right? And I think, as you say, when you see people who really do live at Maslow 1, right, like they're, they're struggling for food, water, and shelter. Yeah. Life takes on a whole new meaning with those people, right? Right. I want to see what circumstances definition. I'm interested in the the root of circumstances because I was just saying about um, circum um, is around and stance is to stare or stare is to stand. Huh, circum to stand around. Oh, the, the standing around and co- circle encompass. Oh, okay. So that's the circumstances mm-hmm. of that. You know, just like we were talking about the dog being protecting, protective, that's all circumstances too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? that's it. It's, it's, that's it. Okay, here, uh, you are just sta- starting. Uh, that's right. It's all about movement, constant movement forward, the brain and body. 
Yeah, that's what we're doing. Moving through a space time where we walk on space through time, right? And then pretty, yeah. and then, but there's also the reciprocal of time space where we walk on time through space. So wrap your mind around that one. But yeah, that's that's for another. <laughs> Yeah, the etymology of words. That's absolutely right to just kind of get a better meaning. I like the meaning of protection. Mm-hmm. If we look at pro is beneficial and tech tactile is like a like a plaster, right? So mm-hmm. beneficial plaster is what protection boils down to. And yeah, right. You know, old fart. Jason Furman just says old fart. Yeah. So uh, Ken yeah. has a question here for you. Don't you think that emotion of guilt is an evolutionary mechanism? Yeah, it could be. Totally. Totally could be. Yeah. I mean, that's the mammalian um, of looking after those children, maybe it boils down to. But like he was yeah, saying. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, like, one, but, you know? but the motivations to do stuff is is my own. Even though, like, you might do a lot of really nice things for other people, typically I think that um, you're doing it because of how it makes you feel. But, like, I think, you know, when you really boil things down, and that's like, yeah, that guilt is something no one wants to live with, right? So you 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 do things to avoid ever being in a position where you feel guilt, right? Um, so for sure, it could be an evolutionary mechanism. Totally, yeah. It's way it's it. I think we're we're headed into territory out of my um, field of expertise. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're starting to delve on the outskirts of philosophy and you know, uh-huh. all that stuff. But I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's the important questions that, I mean, we can't really answer, but uh, uh-huh. they're, they're cool to discuss. And same thing with like the dog, you know, it's like, what does that dog feel? We can't really answer that because we're not dogs. Yeah, we can make our best guess, right? And we can read behavior. I think that's the, that's sort of the key metric for all of this kind of stuff is we can like, we know all the conversations you see people having about like, why is the dog doing that? And how does the dog feel really the, the best guess that we have, unless we're going to be kicking around, like you say, with that fMRI on the dog while he's performing his daily jobs. Right. I think is we, we read their behavior and seldom if ever do dogs lie in their behavior, right? Like they, they can, well, in the, in the appearance of their attitude, right? Like they're, they're, the way a dog looks, if he looks good, if he looks happy, he typically is, right? There's not right. too many dogs that are thinking, fuck my life, as they're walking around with their tails up, ears, <laughs> the ears up, tail up, got the chest out. And that, that to me, looks like a, a happy dog. Um, and and we, have to, we have to draw that, you know, we have to make that leap. We have to go, okay, he looks like that, he feels like that. And I think that's the best, for now anyway, that's the best we can do. Well, I mean, we're, he's gaining access of what we know about dogs by watching them communicate with each other. He's given, he's gaining access to a pretty important information site on his body by leaving that mm-hmm. tail up, head up, you know, and that's how dogs communicate with body language and with distance and all that sound too, and tonation. And so mm-hmm. we kind of, kind of look at it um, that way as well. Just kind of, that's mm-hmm. what I do as far as, you know, somebody that's looking at it, you know, as a different species. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't go sniff people's butts when I, get, I meet them. <laughs> yeah, well, you could. It, it, I wouldn't recommend it. It's yeah. probably not going to get too well. Yeah, I mean, and that's it too. Is that we have to realize that there are um, motives that that are present with this animal, and that was the biggest thing that I learned too. Is that um, how do I get these dogs to be flashy? How because in the pet dog world, we're always being paid to stop behavior. Mm. for the most part you know for the how my dogs react in, on the leash how do i get them to stop my dog's mm-hmm. barking like crazy at the mailman how do i get them to stop my dog is in the car and anytime p- people walk by they lose their shit how do i get them to stop mm-hmm. you know um and it's because it's embarrassing <laughs> you know they're like dude I, c- I can't stand the way that people look at me when this happens and so yeah um it's emotionally motivated and it, when we're when we're acting on emotion based on pure intellect we are 10 times more likely to act than we are on pure intellect that's why these the fortune 500 companies they pay billions and billions of dollars to get people to view their products in an emotional light right mm-hmm. and so they'll buy they're more likely to buy but us as dog trainers we are in the emotional arena with these animals and that's what you were saying about how it's taken it's not really taken good when you when they pay you to tell you the truth tell them the truth yeah and yeah we have to have some tact in that right like it, you have to kind of uh 
It depends on the people. I think that there's there's plenty of like Bertie O'Sheedy has come on our uh, podcast a couple of times, and she she actually runs training on you know how to deal with clients. She's a clinical psychologist and and runs training for dog trainers on how to you know give people the advice they need. Right? She's not trying to tell you how to read the dog and what to do with the dog but how to distill that information into a way that the people will receive it and receive it well, right? And receive it in a way that they'll enact what you're telling them. Um, because I think there's certainly an art to that and it's necessary because I think, it, it, you know, as soon as you get a client on the back foot, then, you know, they'll probably smile and nod at you for the remainder of the session. And then as they walk out, they're not doing any of the things you say, right? And yeah. so, you know, like people who, um, and, and, and I think every like different clients at different stages are different. I get, I, I'm lucky because most of my clients are um, either dog trainers already uh, or, uh, you know, sport dog people, right? Like they're dog training enthusiasts. Right, um, and yeah. And so fortunately I get to be fairly abrupt with people and I have kind of a saying where I'm like, Hey, you know, like <laughs> I'm a nice guy, but sometimes the platoon side, the army like drill sergeant comes out of me every now and again, and I do my best to keep him in, but every now and again, he comes out. Right. Um, and so, uh, but you have to like in the moment, I think this is one of the sort of the, 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 uh, the, the key features of a good trainer is that in the moment we need to be abrupt and we need to be, you know, like I don't have time to spare your feelings because the behavior is unfolding in front of us, right? And I need you to do the thing. But then afterwards we put the dog away and then we need to change gears completely. And I think that's where some people struggle is they then hold that grudge. So you get yourself into a position where you're like, do it now, 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 and like now do this, now do this. And then we put the dog away and then the people come out and then they're still in their face, right? Like you did this, you did this, you did this. Okay. But I think the tact is then like if you must be abrupt with people because the timing and the situation dictates it, when it no longer dictates it, that's where you have to then go, okay, like let's wind that all the way back. Let's understand what happened and let's completely change tact and go back to that like um, lower stress learning, right? Yeah. Um, and I think dealing with a lot of clients, so I'm lucky that most of mine are really aware of that and they're really passionate in that and they understand timing and that sort of thing. But I think when you dealing with the average pet owner you have to explain that you have to say like hey like in the moment things have to happen we're dealing we've we front loaded them with the concepts of behavior and timing and that sort of stuff so they understand like okay this is why things need to happen when they happen and your the outcome for your dog is more important to me <clears throat> than your feelings in that moment yeah, right absolutely. but then you got to remember to put that on the shelf afterwards and say okay like now we can just have a nice conversation because there is no timing component. Like we have time to make sure you understand this. We have time to to go through it in like baby steps until you understand and then we go to the next bit, the next bit, the next bit. Whereas when we have the dog with us, we don't have time for that. And that's why I'm such a big uh, proponent of super short sessions. Like I don't like I, it, like group class and that kind of stuff. I don't run it. You know, it kind of makes my skin itchy because there's just all these periods where the dogs are doing the, the, the dogs are either doing exactly what we wanted them to do and not getting reinforcement or the dogs are doing the total opposite of what we want them to do and they are being reinforced, right? And there's all this mess, whereas for me, I like to control the dog and the situation very precisely so that we get the outcome that we want, right? And like I say, that sometimes comes at the cost of um, people's feelings in that moment. But I promise you then afterwards, I'll make up for it, right? We'll go back to being nice. I'll put that army drill sergeant back away and 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 the, the nice guy dog trainer will come back out. And I think like I have pretty good success doing that. And I think... I think when people manage that, that's how you can keep people on on um, on your side and also invested in the training. Uh, because, like you said, most of the time people are bringing you around to get their dog to stop doing something, and and they don't actually want their dog suppressed. I think that it, like I certainly used to talk about this and complain about it and that sort of stuff. But people, when they understand it, they don't want their dog suppressed. They want behaviors that are conducive to living well with a dog, right? right and that. For most people, they most dog trainers then go, okay, that's suppression. Like you want your dog suppressed. Now, we may not use that language, but that's what they're going to do for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to come around to the idea like that doesn't really – that's not necessarily the case, right? What they want is a dog that is 
able to just chill out in their house, but then provided that they can provide them those windows of expression, they can do it. And so spending more time showing them how to let their dog blast off, right? Like, hey, here's the window to go absolutely batshit crazy and do, you know, give your, like, fulfill yourself, right? Go do the thing that you like to do. Yeah, yeah. And then that way we don't even really address the, the chilling out part because it happens quite naturally, right? Like the dog's natural state is lazy. Like my Malinois, Who's a you know very high drive all dog? He's asleep on it. around right. Yeah, we all have. Yeah, he's asleep on the floor right now, right? Because just before I came on to you, we were out training, and he got to blast off, and he goes, you know, batshit crazy, and he gets to bite stuff, and I let him destroy things, and we have these windows for that, and that results in a dog that like. You know, the average, most people, when dog trainers come to my house or they see video of my dog in the house, they think like this is, this dog has no discernible drive whatsoever, right? Like he, he won't clean up food that's on the floor. He doesn't play with toys. He just chills out. He mopes around. He walks slowly. But then when we hit the field, the shit, on. like, yeah, the switch gets flicked. And it's only because of that. It's only because of one that we get the other. And I think way too much people, like dog trainers especially, because I was that guy, he's certainly getting the mindset of, oh, this person just wants their dog suppressed. Here we go. I'll just uh, I'll just suppress your dog for you. Now your problem's gone, right? And that's easy. That's the easy part. And Five it, minutes. You can do it to the dog. Yeah. So, you know, that's right. You can flatten the dog out really quick. Yeah. Whereas, you know, explaining to the people, like teaching them and, and actually going through and like, you know, you then can, you're way less hands on with the dog. If a dog's got a real specific problem, of course, you're, you're involved, you're in the weeds there, right? right? Yeah, but, but typically if the dog's just being an asshole in the house, it's because he's not getting an opportunity to be an asshole elsewhere. Yeah. Well, remember what you said, fulfillment. You know, I call yeah. it a good steam vent too. You know, it's just a good way to just blow off some steam in a, in a constructive yeah. way. Um, and then I, I want to touch on too, like what you were talking about, how the group classes um, and that, and how it's, it, you know, we're waiting for that dog and we, we're doing little training sessions. And that's why even when you go to your seminars, the audit spots are the same prices as if you have a dog. Yeah. And, and that is, you want to speak on that? Because we talked about this earlier and I wanted to, 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 um, yeah, to it's still something that confuses and upsets people, but, uh, but if there's I a don't like to, behind it, you know, yeah. So I don't like to charge, uh, any different for audit versus, um, working spots. So I, you know, I like there to be about 10 dogs there. That gives us a good opportunity to work the dogs. And there's a few reasons, right? So firstly, I've been at seminars. I've been an attendee at seminars where, uh, we, like I was bored out of my brain because it's the same problem. Like we've got 10 dogs, but they may as well be carbon copies of each other. Right. Yep. And so we never get to see the the presenters full spectrum of what they want to teach and what they're there to pass on to us because we have that. And that can just be pure luck, right? That can just be pure luck because they were the first 10 people to book and they got the working spots. The other one, I've had that happen to me as well, where like early days when I was doing this, like I, it looked as though I was a one trick pony. Like I was just doing the one thing with all the dogs that came out, but it was because they all had the same issue. Right. So it was like, well, this is the first hole that we have to plug. And I could see other people and like the auditors of that place, like, Hey, I'm not learning how to apply this stuff. I'm not learning one step of it. Right? right. Everything else has been theory. And then because of the way I like to train dogs is I don't like to do very long sessions. I go for as long as appropriate. And sometimes that's a really long session and sometimes that's 30 seconds. And, and certainly, you know, for certain behavior cases and that sort of thing, I've had situations where at a workshop, we've got, you know, 60 people in the room and we're going to walk the dog into the room. If it goes the way we want, we're going to click, we're going to jackpot him and we're going to walk out. Right. So like that's it it's done and even if he reacts we're gonna like wait out there you know we're gonna deal with that we're gonna wait out the reaction under pressure we're gonna click and we're gonna walk out so no matter how this goes good or bad it's gonna be over in two minutes right and so i never want to be put in a position where i want to do something that's not right for the dog in order to make the people feel good right like you see people who are like oh well you know i paid for a working spot i um bill got an hour with his dog because his dog was ready for it and I got 30 seconds with my dog. So now I'm upset about that. So that's another reason why I don't like people to pay anymore. Yeah. But the main reason, the really main reason is uh, I like the um, the flexibility to get out dogs, right? So, you know, at, at, there's always people who bring dogs that aren't meant to. That always happens, right? You didn't have a working spot, but you got nowhere else to keep your dog. So he's in the car or, you know, wherever you traveled and you, there was no one. So the, the dogs are there. And 
more and more like my workshops that I teach are, are less about fixing a specific problem with anybody's dog um, rather than it's more about teaching a process for learning. And, and I'm all about foundation skills. I'm kind of obsessively into foundation skills. Um, and so if I want to teach a particular thing and I say, hey, who's got a dog at this point, right? Like a classic one I always use is I like to teach the, the unforced force fetch, right? right? So what I love to have at the workshop is a dog who can take something in his mouth. So that's like, you know, a week of training to get to that point. We're not going to do that there. So a dog who can already bite something a little bit, right? So he'll take it and spit it out after a second or two, yep. because then he's at the perfect point for us to show how to build that duration. And then we can unfold all the, the good parts that come of that unforced force fetch. And we can explain how that becomes a retrieve and that becomes the understanding of pressure and that becomes a bite work. And there's, you know, we can go through all of that. And often like at the working spots, maybe someone brings out their dog and it's got a perfect hold, bang. Like here's my IPO three dog, bang. He bites it, he never lets go, he never chews, never does nothing. Well, that's great. That's impressive, but that's not helpful for the learning of everybody else, right? And so if I've got those, like, and then I've got dogs that don't hold anything. Okay, well, now everybody gets to see the the first session, which is unimpressive, right? Like we're not making a lot of ground in that first session. That's why I like the freedom to then say, hey, who's got a dog at this level? Okay, go get him. Um, and for me, the workshops are much less about making anybody's dog better right there and then because that that's a putting a band-aid on a problem like that's a putting a band-aid on a sucking chest wound what i want to do is uh give everybody in the crowd the skills and the tools to do it to their own dog when they go home and give them a, a road map on how to do that like so they actually have a plan on when i leave here this is what i'm going to do i'm going to do this 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 is step one two three and i'm going to go through all the way um, because I see it all the time and, and there's a lot of pressure, like as a teacher, there's a lot of pressure to get some good results right here, right now. And you can see people want, like, I want to see a miraculous change in this dog. And, you know, I've been, I've been playing with dogs a little while now. Um, and I'm reasonably good at it. I can make it look like that for sure. If that's what you want. And I think uh, I see a lot of people doing that at workshops and seminars where they make it look like they've made a huge success in the dog. But the problem with that is like more often than not, what you've actually done is installed a booby trap that's going to come back later on, right? So I can make the dog look good right now, but chances are like, and and maybe in the room of 50 people, one or two people in the room are going to be able to read fully what I did, right? And the, the owner of the dog leaves happy and goes, yay, like all good to go. And then they go home and like six weeks later, that behavior completely crumbles and turns into aggression on them or, you know, whatever, right? There could be many, many things. So for me, I'm all about foundation skills and, and with the big ticket items, the big issues that people typically have. Um, if we put the time into the foundation skills, almost never do we have to address any of the big things because they, they, they're all from foundation. So we, we fix the foundation. As I always say, there's no builder ever turned up to your house to do a renovation and said, oh, this foundation is too strong, right? Like that, <laughs> that never I love happened. That. I love that. Yeah. But what does happen is they turn up and you're like, hey, I want this extra story put on. He says, so this, this, this structure can support that right? That happens all the time. And so for me, it's all about build that strong foundation, get it all to the point where the, the, the extra stories just click on bang, 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 bang. And it all falls out of the foundation skills. Absolutely. Well, and, and I'm going to go through here real quick. I mean, mm. great, great points. I mean, the foundation is where it's at and that's where, where everything is built upon. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, interesting, uh, going back to, I think when we were talking about the dog's feelings, but, mm. um, uh, it's interesting to think about dogs hiding injury, though. Is that a form of lies? Yeah, could be. But I mean, I don't know. Like, do we see that much, right? I, I, like, I think that dogs maybe don't like show their injury so much when they're in drive because they've kind of, that's, you know, pushed to the back of their mind when they're in drive. They're no longer feeling the pain. Right. Everything's um, so popped up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if a dog were hiding its injuries, I, I can't, I, I don't imagine a dog will be hiding its injuries from people. I, I, I imagine that like a, a group of wild dogs or street dogs or whatever might hide injuries from their others in order to not be seen as a weak link. For sure, that would be possible. But I'm not sure that I ever see dogs hiding injuries from um, their own handler. This, I mean, trust me, I know a thing or two about dog injuries. My dog is perpetually injured. He's got <laughs> right before you zero, fly out of town. <laughs> he's, got, he's got zero self-preservation and and he regularly will want to do things that he shouldn't. And I don't think it's a lie. Like he just wants to do them. And he's he's when he's in drive, he's 
willingness to endure pain is through the roof to the point where it, it doesn't really stop, right? So um, he's not lying. He just doesn't care at that time. Yeah, so that, that competing motivator, one one is motivating him way more than that other is, you know, to stop. Mm. Um, but mm. Also, uh, what was I just going to say? The dang, Oh, I've seen dogs feign injuries to better their situation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. And that's just yeah. like a learned behavior, right? Like right. Limp walking like this gets me inside or whatever. Yep, it gets me. And not only that, but it's been argued if we have uh, – the science of dogs, I think, is a National Geographic or Dogs Decoded, one of these documentaries where there's a, a school in Hungary, I think, Budapest, where they study dogs. It's all about dogs. And they've seen how dogs manipulate us, you know, by yeah. looking up and into our left eye and, and stuff. And it's, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting to know that, yeah. that they can, um, you know, do the hard way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kevin O'Grady says there's a fine line between motivated, flashy behavior and nervy, neurotic behavior. I feel like uh, they can look similar, but the mental state of the dog is very different. Scattered. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's that's that education piece on being able to tell the difference, right? Like mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of people who think that their dogs are, you know, super high drive where, you know, breeding, like say in the working dog world, dogs that are really – you drive their drive comes through possession and that sort of thing that's a hard thing to breed for but what is easier to do is to throw in a bit of nerve and that expresses as drive right until the nerve is uncovered and so for sure that's an issue but again that comes down to being able to read the dog correctly and and you know the experience of doing that like i like i say I, it makes me sick to think about the things i used to say about my first dog who was nervy and i used to think like he was amazing but you know oh he's guarding me he's a monster you know, he was a very dangerous dog, but I don't think he probably would have ever actually bit anyone. I don't think that he had the courage to engage. He's quite very dangerous. Like he might have been a nipper, that kind of thing, you know. But um, whereas my current dog will bite your arm off, but he's not dangerous in the slightest because he wouldn't do it like through nerve. He'll only do that when he's told or when the, when the conditions are correct, right? So he's not dangerous in the slightest because there's hardly any nerve in that dog. He's the strong – like – probably genetically the strongest dog I've ever owned. Really? Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I think that it's a constant. My wife just got home. She's teaching a class right now. So she's got home with her students. So it might be a yes. cacophony happening, but uh, we'll make it, we'll make it through together. You and I, Pat. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. But... It's a dog show. People expect some barking. <laughs> yeah, don't, I hope so. <laughs> dogs bark. And especially after this nay po po, man, my dogs are barking like idiots sometimes. Really? Oh yeah, man. They're, they're like, I never knew. <laughs> I never knew that this was possible, you know, <laughs> and their tails yeah. are up and wagging. And I mean, they're maniacs. And, um, mm -hmm. and even talking to Bart, he's like, uh, you know, I went back over to Jackie's and he's like, this, you must understand is Jackie's interpretation of Napopo. And that's what I love about what they do is they're like, put your spin on it, you know, take mm -hmm. and apply it in ways that, you know, once you understand it, yeah, and, uh, I think that's important, like, to understand that everybody that's out there teaching it uh, is teaching their version, right? Like, yeah, and, um, you know, the the silver schools that Bart does, like, there's no – it's not like he's working off a of PowerPoint. He's making that shit up as he goes. Like, he's, he's handing over his 45 years of knowledge, and he says that, like, you know, I've done a lot of them because I, you know, organized them here in Australia, and um, he says the same thing differently different times. So there's, like, I think some people who just see it one time take, like, as gospel something that he – like the specifics where what he meant was the the overarching ethos of what he said was right. what he meant rather than the specifics of the words that he used on that day. So everybody has their own interpretation of it and, and people, you know, what's important to them becomes um, the, the way that they teach it um, for sure. But the barking's a funny one, right? And like we see that a lot from people who are new to shaping when people start doing that because yeah. like that barking becomes – part of like an extinction related behavior and when you're shaping you're counting on extinction right like right. you're counting on like i taught you to go to the marker board now i'm waiting and and sit and i'm waiting on that behavior to like within the extinction burst to bring on a new behavior and maybe stand and i'm gonna mark that and for sure 
barking is often accompanied in that and if you mark in that moment then the barking can become a superstitious behavior as part of your stand right yeah. so that's kind of one of the tricky things when people who are new to shaping really get into it that's for sure some issues i had was some of the extinction related behaviors that happen within the the mark and can lead to it can be hard to get rid of especially like if it's really tightly associated with the the wanted behavior so like i use that example because that's exactly what my dog did right so my dog in his stand barks because he's i'm positive that the first time he went from the down to the stand he was like is it this like and, and basically yelled at me as i did it yeah. and i clicked and was like yeah it is that right and now that's a part of him right like that's part of it he thinks it standing involves a, a big yelling old. at me yeah yeah and so it was man that took me a long time to get rid of that was a hard thing to to get rid of because it's i can't punish that away because it's a t he thinks barking and standing is the same thing right so like if i punish the barking i also punish the standing and i don't want that i need that right so it's very tricky difficult process in in having him understand no that's not part of the criteria right when a superstitious behavior if it's in the chain it can be fairly easy to get rid of like a superstitious behavior within a chain of behaviors right, right. that can be easier but when it's attached to a behavior holy shit, that can yeah, be hard especially yeah. if it's a big muscle movement right yeah like the down to the stand boom big bark and even still now like because i taught that on the clack clack when he's on the clack clack he'll bark off the clack clack i've managed to get rid of it and in competition he'll never have the clack clack right but when he's on it he pops up yeah, but because yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. a clang yeah and so it's all part of the <laughs> it's all part of the show to him and so that's yeah it's hard but that's the thing about those clear windows right when you start jacking dogs up you got to have the window where you go like hey this is where you're barking this is where you can bark at me and push me around and i like it right and now that window shut and now you can no longer bark at me and you can no longer push me around and and doing so will bring you no success right, right? and it, it, well that's the moment that you crate right here at my feet you know she knows that she doesn't bark and push me around in this crate but out here yeah you know absolutely it's totally different you know ball game because i've i've shown her over and over nope that's unacceptable uh-uh that's not what we do mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a it's it's tricky right and it's consistency you know i talk about like you know my dog has pretty good house manners i, I don't even know where he is Hold on, would you check. jackpot him if he didn't bark is that you're just waiting for that freaking silent stand right and then jackpot <laughs> i wore him out truth be told the way i did that was i wore him out to the point where he couldn't be bothered barking and then jackpotted him okay. so i had to i had to bring on a condition where it wouldn't happen and so i wore him so that he was exhausted and then got the stand from him and of course the, the criteria of the stand was not great because he was so exhausted yeah, that he couldn't uh, he just couldn't be bothered parking and then i showed him boom okay there you go there's your reinforcer but this the issue then is you know like that he's a barky dog he enjoys barking like that's just like he he for no reason will just go rah, 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 right? Right. like it's just something here. in fact i remember fun. when i had him he was 12 weeks old he was on a back mm -hmm. tie and i was uh just doing some rag work with him and um you know like you get them chasing the rag and then they bark at it one time and you flick it in the mouth and you go for two barks and bart was watching me and he he knows i don't like barky dogs and, and, in, and in psa where i play there's only one time the dog has to bark he only has to bark in the carjacking that's it there's, the guard can be silent and he knew that i wanted a silent guard because in those upper levels there's so much madness going on that if you can keep the dog quiet and that's helpful right like, like he's going to hear more commands that sort of thing and Bart said to me, he goes, hey, you want a silent guard on that dog when he grows up, right? I was like, yeah. He goes, don't let that fucker bark anymore because he enjoys <laughs> it so much. Like at 12 weeks old, you can see him like, hey, like I'm enjoying this. And it's self-reinforcing. He enjoys doing it. So like I say, like as an extinction-related behavior, um, once that becomes superstitious and attached to another behavior, that can be really difficult to get rid of because it's not even a case of no longer reinforcing it because it's self-reinforcing. You can't not reinforce that. You have to show him like, hey, that's it's it's in your interest not to do that and you'll be paid better for not doing it. Yeah, and to discern exactly what you're trying to cleave off here. You know, yeah. Because then it'll, it'll But as I was saying before, I was trying to see if he's behind me, but um, it like I talk about house manners and how it was trained in my dog and like it's a hundred percent punishment based in my house but it's not positive punishment it's negative punishment and that he's a social dog he's affiliated he's a malinois he likes to be with people right put him away. and as soon as he does something he just gets put away yep. right like hey, you're outside and so it's a slow process but certainly the most effective and that's how i've had this dog who 
um, just knows, like he basically walks on eggshells in the house. And like I say, he doesn't, he, he just knows if I kick into drive, I'm getting put outside and I don't want to be put outside because um, this is the way the people are. But what you also see is when he gets revved up and, you know, like things happen, he gets the, he gets antsy. Maybe like I've fed it, like he's funny one. If I feed him raw, like game meat, if he eats, if he eats um, deer or something like that, he gets, goes berserk. Gets but now he picks himself up. He takes himself outside and he goes and does the zoomies outside. He's figured out how to get into my kid's trampoline. He gets in the trampoline and goes ballistic in there and shakes it off and then comes back inside. Or right? a steam vent, you know? That's a yeah, that's it. And you got to like teach him. That's a teaching process. But he's figured that out himself by, like I said, when, you, when he just expresses drive in the house, out he goes. And so it's a clear window. This is not... And then, you know, I'm lucky I have an area to train, so we don't train in the house. There's, I'd never feed him in the house. I never ask for behaviours in the house because when I ask for behaviours, I expect them to happen powerfully and flashily, okay. and I expect that because I pay for them well, right? right? So if I were to ask him to sit in the house, he would sit, but then he would be like, hey, like now I'm in a heightened state of arousal and I want some reinforcement because you told me to do something. So I don't ask for anything in the house. I just, when he does something I don't want, he goes out and, over the period of his life, he's figured out what to do. And I don't have strict rules in the house either. Like I think that's something I really prescribe to. It's a Jordan Peterson thing. Like the rules that I have, I enforce 100%. Like there's there's no breaking the rules. But I don't want to be that guy that's enforcing rules all day. I don't want to be like walking around like a dictator. So as a result, I don't have many. Micro, right? Like the, manager. Yeah, so I don't have many rules so that when, when the, the ones that I have, they're easy to enforce because they're, they're few and far between. Well, and they're easy to understand too, because they're few and far between. Exactly. Exactly. Is there yeah. a fine line between? Okay, that, that's what we already did. That one motivated uh, little asshole likes to pl a little asshole plays jump rope with that line. I don't know what that. I, something we've said, but off topic. I have a quick question. How would you suggest pairing an already motivated signal squeaky with a less desirable reward food? So the, she wants to do a signal with the food. Thanks for amazing content from both of you. Or he. Is it Dalton? Is it a guy? I don't know. Motivated signal with the less desirable food. Well, I, would eat, I wouldn't try and do that. I would increase the desire for the food. Yeah, yeah. Oops. Close the restaurant, you know? Yeah. So and, and I think, you know, like everything that you reinforce your dog with, it has a it has a different value to the dog. Like we try and get everything to the maximum, but they're different along the way. And, like I think I feel like with your own dog, with a board and train, if you're doing one, this might be a harder thing to do. But I think with your own dog, you should be able to line up every one of these toys, his reinforcers, and you know, hopefully you've built the all those to the maximum, and he should take whatever you offer. But I think if you line them up, you should know which is the most potent to the least potent for your dog, and then use the one that's appropriate for the phase that you're in, right? So like my dog, food is perfect to teach him something new right? Like he, he stays in a state of arousal where he can absolutely learn. Um, he's clear, he's calm. He wants the food very much. He knows there's a consequence if he, if he doesn't get it, like if he doesn't perform in order to get it, but he, like, he's not, um, he's not in a state of arousal that causes stress and therefore impacts learning. Whereas like the chuck it, you know, like just a normal tennis ball in the throwing thing is, the highest value reinforcer I can have for my dog, except for like the bite work, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can't teach my dog anything in the pres in the presence of that thing. Um, but I use it when like to proof behaviors or to give particular behaviors the highest value that I, I can. Okay. What's he say? I'm concerned about the squeaky relevant, just trying to give the food more value with a signal he already finds reinforcing. Like you could use that squeaky as a as a marker oh, if, yeah. if, if that, but the pr problem is that you, probably the reason it has as much value as it does, if it does, is because the dog then gets to squeak it itself, right? Like it enjoys the the biting of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows what they enjoy, man? I mean, it could be the bite. It could be the chase. It could be the, you know, the the rush that they get after the, after it, you know, after sitting there with their tongue. <laughs> and then don't worry. Mm. I mean, we're, I mean, there's toys, there's food, but then there's also water too. And whistling, whistling the, the water and, uh, that's a big tool too, man. I started with my yeah, yeah. and uh, she comes running when she hears that whistle. I never realized. Yeah, it's a powerful it. one, hey. Yeah, especially if you get up a bit about that. Like it's a you know it's a bit of a knee popo thing. Is that um, well, it's not a specific to us, but a lot of the people do it because they learn it from Bard is charging the whistle with water. Yeah. Um, and it's not that I've ever like I would never have ever withheld water from my dog, but there's times I can count on him being thirsty, Absolutely. and so it makes sense to 
blow the whistle before he gets it. You know, I get a puppy. We're gonna he's gonna come out of the crate, go to the toilet. We're gonna train with kibble. He's gonna then do some rag work with a um, you know, like a jute. Uh, you know, hessian sack. His mouth's gonna be dry as hell. And it, 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 of course, he's gonna need to drink after that. I may as well. Yeah, the leather rag. It's gonna dry his mouth out. Yeah. Of course, he needs to drink after that. So it makes sense to pair a marker to that. Why not? Yeah, and then not only that, but I do a cold ceramic bowl, nice cold water, and I mean, I know that they're hot, mm-hmm. and I know that they're just getting. Um, and, and it's almost like a jackpot to me too, because it's always happening yeah. at the end there and they just lay there yeah. with that freaking water bowl with their tongue just dripped in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I Have you ever it. tried coconut water? With dogs? Yeah. Mom, yeah, they love it. They well, most love it. So I had this little black Mallee years ago and I was unloading the shopping and dropped the thing of coconut water and smashed all over the floor. And, you know, she comes over and started licking it and then went crazy licking it. Like was like who oh, it off the floor. It. I love you. Yeah. And then I, remember, I stood there and I was like, mm-hmm, I can <laughs> hold this over you. <laughs> so, yeah, I used to carry around like the, the spray bottle. And people, uh, you know, like, oh, it's for spraying the dog in the face. I'm like, yeah, but not as a punishment. Like, my dog jumps up, and I had it, and I'd, like, squirt her in the mouth. And she'd be like, what's cute is what's watching them trying to uh, wrap their tongue around it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Squirt it in her mouth, and <laughs> off she goes. Yeah, they love it. Well, I, I won't say all dogs love it, but certainly – the ones that I've had do for sure. Well, they just perk up, man. They'll come flying back. They prefer that water because they know it's fresh. They know it's cold and, and it yeah, makes, perfect. And feel it better. So situation, you know, basically mm-hmm. that's it. I uh, love that point. Perfect. This is going back a little bit, just so you know, the perfect okay. balance and working on honing, helping the dog know when to chill and when to blow their shit. You know, you have to have mm-hmm. an on and an off. And that's where I learned uh, by proxy through Adrian little who i see is joining us as well uh, she was like yeah patrick or, or patrick <laughs> uh, pat was telling me that uh you have to have an on switch or you have to have an off switch otherwise this dog is going to be shaping fucking everywhere all over the place trying to get paid yeah. knocking your shit off yeah. the, the, the end tables and you know and looking at you like is this it is this it? You know? yeah yeah um, man that's so important because n- not only does it make the dog more livable but also it makes the shaping more potent because you say like this is the time like now your reinforcement's available like if the dog's always looking around like is this it is this it is this it like yeah that's a headache to live with you can manage that but then the dog is constantly maybe doing things that you do want and not getting reinforced right, right. so you want to show like whether you do what I want or not, you're outside the window. So, you know, when I open, the, when I give you the opportunity, take it. Yeah. What is your cue to work? Uh, depends. So, like, with puppies, with young dogs, I like to take a collar off um, because, uh, you know, in the home, it's just easier management, having a little um, – just have a very small collar with, a like, a cobra buckle, you know, like it clicks off. Yeah. Um, and that becomes a cue. When I take that off, the restaurant is open. And when I put it back on, the restaurant is shut. I also tend to then pair a word um, because I have kind of a generic shaping word where I say go to work, right? And that means that's like impressive. start finding the behavior. And that that go to work ends up becoming like what I describe as a, a sacrificial command because whatever behavior I'm teaching, that becomes a command to do that behavior. Okay. And then I, I use that along the way until I'm happy with the behavior and the dog can perform the behavior in the presence of some distractions and for the highest value reinforcer. And at that time, I name the behavior. Okay. So it kind of is this generic um, go to work just means go do the thing that you're learning to do. And then it, 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 it I give it up once once i give the behavior its real final name and then how do and for you- me like I, I prefer not to name a behavior until my dog can do it in like not name it like name it with its final name what it will be until my dog can do it in the presence of his highest value reinforcer so in that you know normally i want the dog to not necessarily know what he's working for but uh, what I like to do then, where before I'm going to name behavior, I want him to know exactly what he's working for. And I bring out the highest value thing. And he's got to prove to me that he can perform the task adequately, like how I want, with the criteria that I want, in order to earn the highest value thing. And then I name it because the name is going to take the value of the power that it has, right? So if the the power of my marker, the way the dog responds when he's finished the behavior, that's how I, I want to maximize that before to put in place of before the behavior. And if I'm careful in how I do that, it's a couple of techniques, right? Like you can name something operantly while the behavior is happening, or you can name right. it classically just before it's going to. Right. Um, but using that sacrificial name, I can then name it classically. Like it's already got a name that built in along the way. And then 
you know, imagine it's going around a cone for an example, right? Like I'm shaping, I take the collar off, I say the dog go to work. He eventually goes around the cone, I take the collar off, I say go to work, he does it perfectly. Now I say to my dog, I take his collar off, I hold him, I say go around, which means nothing to him, I wait one second, I say go to work and then he goes around and then I reinforce him with his highest value reinforcer. And then he, when that name is given to the behavior, it's with the power of the highest value reinforcer. I think sometimes people name the behavior too early because we want like that reflex response and they get a reflex, but for a lower value reinforcer that they were using for teaching okay. rather than for finishing the behavior. I think yeah. I'm guilty of that now that I listen to you. Yeah. yeah, most people are. It took me a little while to understand that. And so, like I say, it, and it can be very frustrating. Like it, that's one of the issues with, with like shaping behaviors. I'm, I'm pro shaping. My current dog was shaped everything. Um, but it can be very frustrating in how long it takes. Um, and, uh, once you, you have to weigh up the pros and cons of it, right? Like, um, I think that the, the real value of shaping, especially the young dog is not, this is my opinion, right? Is not actually in the teaching of the behaviors. It's the mindset that it puts into the dog. So like if I spend 18 months trying to teach a dog, all the behaviors that he needs, if I try and free shape all of those, but don't actually manage to pull off any of them, right? Like I don't actually manage to get the dog to understand any of the things I'm trying to teach him. In that 18 months, I will have built such a powerful, motivated dog, such an operant dog that using luring or pressure or whatever, I'll teach those behaviors in a week, right? Because I've prepared the dog to learn. And that's the difference. Like when you hear people talk about old Nipopo and new Nipopo. So new Nipopo is you let the dog find the behavior. Right. And old Nipopo is you show the dog the behavior and everything else is the same after that. Uh, yeah. So even your efforts to stay new Nipopo, if you don't actually manage to teach the dog the behaviors, no worries, because by the time he's ready for it, you just go old knee popo and you just show him the behavior. Yeah. So it's like people kind of like people can get a little bit carried or what like caught up in like, no, it has to be this. It doesn't have to be anything, right? Like it it it's whatever's gonna work. And like for me, like I say, I think the real power of the shaping is to give attitude rather than the final behavior. If you can teach the final behavior, fantastic, great, and you should. Like I say, my own dog is totally shaped, but it's it has its downsides as well. It's not the be all and end all because like certainly something I, like a, a, an issue I have with my dog is he won't follow a food lure because uh, I introduced the food as a conflict in the shaping way too early with him. Oh. And, and you know, I, mate, I still remember the session. I had him on the, I had him on the meal. With the hold or was it? Yeah, okay. totally with the hold. And I had the food as a conflict and the job here, right? So right. where's my hand? I'm trying to get on yeah, the camera. Cluster, yeah. I've got food there and the job here. And of course he wants to take the food and I take it away. And then I, he's got to do it. So like he learned at a very young age, take, like ignore that food, do the work to earn the food. And if in that session I had just unclipped him and then, you know, lured him a little bit on the floor, like it would have kept that open, but I did way too much of it. And so now my dog is convinced whenever you present me the food, that's a conflict right. to, to make sure I do something else. And at the end of the day, it's no big deal. It's no problem because like now, if I need to get a behavior, like right now I can shape it because he's very operant. He, he understands, like I can tell him even at three years old now, I can say, Hey, we're learning something new. And he goes, okay, let me figure it out. But also um, he's very in tune to pressure. So I can use pressure as a lure, right? And it's not a lot of it. Like he understands. I can say the same thing to him. I say, hey, you're learning something new. And then he can be like, okay, like put me where you need me. Go old knee po po. Put me where you need me. Yep. Take off the pressure. Give me the positive. And then he learns it very, very quick. Yep, got it. And, you know, yeah, like when I talk my dog to guard, I had to send him to the guard. It was the it was the dumbest way I've ever seen anybody teach a dog to guard. And I would never recommend anybody do it. But it worked perfectly for my dog. And that we had like four prong collars on him, right? Like one, a line going forward, two going either way, and one going behind and had a decoy downfield. And people on those lines in every direction, I said to the dog, go to work. And he was like, okay, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. Right? I've never worn four prong collars. Before. He's all eyeballing everybody. <laughs> yeah. And just basically went limp and was like, put me where you need me. And so, because he's very tuned to prong collar pressure, like he knows like that's guiding pressure. And so the person behind the decoy kind of reeled him in until he was in front of the decoy then he was not quite straight this one over here tapped him over he goes into it 
I walk over to him while he's in the behavior. I say, guard, Stellan, and he gets to buy it. We buy it, we out, we reset, we do the exact same thing. And this time he's almost beating the, the prong collar pressure into the position. Again, he wasn't quite uh, where we wanted. He actually went too close this time. So the line behind sort of drags him back and he goes, okay, it's here. I say, guard, Stellan, bang. Third rep, he goes in, does it. So like he was very attuned to like, oh, I see what's happening here. You're teaching me something new yeah, and I'm in tune to the pressure. So that in that moment is old Nipopo. There was nothing, there's no shaping about that whatsoever, right? We, like you can't be any more in control of a dog than four prong collars in every direction. Yeah. But the dog is like, okay, I get it. You're teaching me something new. Let's show me where it's at. So we could have shaped it and it might have taken, who knows, who knows how long. But we taught it in three reps to a dog that is, ready to understand it like that and like i say would i ever teach it that way again i have no idea like it depends on the dog, the dog and my time frame and all these sorts of things right but that's kind of the difference right? when when people want to understand new nipopo and old nipopo the new nipopo you let them find it old nipopo you show them the behavior and everything else is the same after that but like i say if you if you spend enough time in new nipopo and they never figure out the behavior no worries go go old nipopo yeah, lure um, as little as possible, but as much as needed. Yeah, ex exactly. Help. That's what we say. Help the dog as little as possible, but as much as necessary. As much as sure. necessary. Yeah, and that's it. That's what yeah. it boils down to. And if people have been watching the positions that I've been doing with my pup, that's old Napopo. Because I'm doing mm -hmm. position and then pressure forward is stand, pressure up is sit, pressure down is down. And I'm trying to make it reflexive right now, where I'm just over yeah, and perfect. over and over, and and then seeing when the, the pressure uh, doesn't isn't immediate right now to see if she's got it right, and and I'm also using the collar at level one and seeing um, uh, how she does with that. And I'm putting the pressure on on the the hold now too, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just such a cool thing because I have not gone through gold like I've gone through silver mm -hmm. and that's it, and uh, I mean it's turned my head upside down. I mean, turn my, head, <laughs> turn my world upside down on its on its head. Yeah, it's you know good. what I'm saying? But I think it's, it's good. good. I think it's absolutely good. Um, but it's also how do I fit this in with pet dog world, right? Yeah. Erno K9 says I had a mal pup at the gold school. It was still amazing to see the progress of the force fetch. Uh, yeah, Adrian. And in, in a week you can do that, right? But at a seminar, I've got one session with the dog. Yeah, and that session is three to four minutes. You know, with the yeah. with the four uh, session or um, the the proper session. Uh, let's see here. I feel like barking in my sleep. I hear barking in my sleep. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, me too. My dog still barks when I ask her to back up. Yeah, that's another because she's right there in your face telling you, hey, yeah, same ones he hits a certain distance. Okay, extinction burst, superstitious behavior. Pat, you know your stuff cold. Listening makes me happy. Thank you for listening, <laughs> Andy, and make sure to share too. I think thanks, he, Matt. I really appreciate that. And I'm gonna have Birdie on here too. She was really dealing with those fires for quite a bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so she just she bought a house right like it, in the stream fires, you know? yeah, exactly talk about um timing but she she got lucky enough it didn't didn't come through thank god so birdie's going to be coming on and i look forward to that as well how to explain stuff better if we lose if we do our pdc i know i'm going to lose points for her mouth what's that the barking Ah, yeah what's the pd yeah it's really common you see it a lot of like that and my dog does it now and the, the problem is it like I say, if it becomes a, attached in the behavior, once your dog starts barking in the healing, that can be a hard thing to get rid of. Like it's not impossible and I've done, I've done it with people and I've managed it with my own dog. But like if you look at when I did my my level two with PSA, I did on the Saturday, uh, past obedience on the Saturday and the Sunday. We didn't get through protection on the Sunday. Uh, but on the Saturday, my dog managed the obedience. It was fine. On the Sunday, he barked as we we're entering the field. And you can see in the footage, you can see him go like, oh, no repercussion for the bark, hey? <laughs> and like, oh, he just barked. Well, look. <laughs> yeah, he just barked the whole way through. And, you know, like mostly we manage barking, I think, because of the state of arousal it comes in, I don't want to punish that level of arousal. So I manage it through negative punishment. Like we just leave. Like, no, yeah, we're done. There's no more reinforcers, yeah. right? But, you know, he was like, this looks exactly like it did yesterday. And I had an awesome time yesterday and the bark popped out. And normally I would just turn around and walk away from him but it didn't happen because we're in trial and then just boom bark the whole way through. <laughs> yeah and so like it's a constant and, and with some dogs it's a you know they're barky dogs they're the it's a constant thing you're going to have to battle and 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 i wish that i had nipped that in the bud earlier right like 
but you know you don't always see this is i think one of the big things about like the really good trainers are the ones that see the behavior in its infancy and know where that's going to go like at the end right and like when i was that's the difference between bart and and me or you know 99.99 percent of the world right. is he could see that at 12 weeks old be like hey be careful because that dog likes to bark and that's going to cause you problems and even being told that and intentionally managing and i still have barking issues right dogs yeah well some people like to freaking can't hold their tongue either and get their their mouth <laughs> too, man. like all the yeah, freaking true. time dude i do the same people and i'm like you know, oh my God, it's Pat. Okay. Oh, Daniel, hi. And then uh, Nelson's out of here. Nelson, thank you, dude. I'm going to have another one with Nelson just to see what his, his he's up to. Uh, nice. Looks like Adrian says, yeah, I fucked that up nicely. I don't know what she's talking about. What did you fuck up nicely? I think that maybe, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows which one is it? Learning how to fix it is a valuable lesson as well. That's right. That's a, like as a glass artist, yeah. that's what they say. Don't go, you don't gauge a good glass artist, but what they create is what you you gauge them, but what they can repair because shit is going to go wrong uh, through, yeah. through the process. Um, well, you know that's like for the talent code. That's something I'm really misunderstood a lot when I first was training and, and read that book. You know, like talk about that deep practice. And to me, I was in the army right for twelve years. And in the army, you are paid 24 seven. So they do not mind making you work 24 seven. And so deep practice for me was a lot of practice. It just meant do it again, do it again, do it again, right. do it again. And the problem with that is you can get really good at doing a shitty version of something, right? Like if you've got a bad habit built into that, you can get really good at doing that Muscle bad memory habit. memory to reinforce it too. Yeah. But then, then I misunderstood deep practice to mean like practice without errors. So never let anything go wrong, control everything so that nothing ever goes wrong. And that's not helpful because that's what you, you know, remind me when you say there with the glass, you got to know how to come back from a mistake because mistakes are inevitable. Like when you, when you 100% control the situation, when you 100% control the training, of course you can make sure that nothing ever goes wrong. You can, you can be sure of that. Right. Right but you don't control the world. You don't control the real world and you certainly don't control competition. So you need to have circumstances where things need to go wrong and you need to learn how to address that error in the moment and come back from that error and get back on track. And that's this, that's, that's the story of deep practice, right? Is understanding like, here's an error I've made a mistake or the dog's made a mistake or whatever. We, we, We've learned how to address that. We know how to come back from it. We, we, we know how that's going to manage and we know how to get back on track. Now we continue, right? And that's, that's the little girl playing the piano in the book, right? right? She doesn't skip over the notes that she plays incorrectly. She addresses them and keeps going. Right. And I think that's something that took me a long time to understand. And once I really truly understood that, like we never skip over errors. We address them every one as they happen, but we let them happen. And in fact, sometimes we make them happen on purpose so that we can address them. Right. Like I do that, like when I'm teaching that hold, I've had dogs that um, I've had client dogs that have this perfect hold bang on a metal pipe and never chew it, but then they're chewing on the grip. So it's like, okay, how can I address this? Like I, I want to teach the dog about pressure and that on the pipe, but he doesn't chew anything. So we, we have to create a circumstance where he will. And I'm telling you, you get a, like a broom <laughs> with like bristles and you put that in the, in a dog's mouth and tell him the whole day, he's going to be like, blah, blah, because it pokes him in the mouth. We go, okay, I created the situation in order to teach you how to get through this situation, the dog rectifies it. Now I can put that into the actual behavior that I want, right? So right. it's about that perfect practice, creating a situation where the dog has a learning moment rather than never encounters a problem, except for when it's for real and doesn't know how to deal with the fixing of that problem. Well, and it's real consequences too, you know, that they put yeah. themselves. You know, we would do it for dogs that would bite too hard on birds. We'd wrap them in chicken wire. And then when they bite down and the wire would be old kind of, school. Yep. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> that was way back. And geez, I didn't want to know. I, or I don't want to talk about it. It's been a long time. Ago. <laughs> so she was talking about naming stuff too early. That's what she fucked up on. Same with me. Uh, okay. Naming stuff too early and not, I mean, I like what you say about that high, high end reward. Do it like, it'd be, and you can, all, it's almost like, like the final, you know, <laughs> like a final exam, yeah. like show me, That's right. show me that. That's right. And the truth is like everybody wants to name behaviors really fast, but the, the behavior has a name. You're just not aware of it. Right. So like if the, if the behavior is happening, it, 
so like repeatedly, there's some there's a cue, right? Now whether you whether you understand that or not, there's a cue because if the behavior is happening, the dog sees that cue and goes, "I'm going to perform the behavior in order to get reinforcement." A name is a cue, so you're better off sticking with whatever that cue is. Take control of that, right? And use it on purpose until you're happy with the behavior. And that's that sacrificial naming. And so for me, like, you know, if you're shaping, if you're shaping your dog to go out to the marker board, right? And before you've named it, you put the marker board out and the dog goes running to it. Well, the presence of the marker board is the cue. That is the name, right? right. So stick with that as long as you need to before you put over like your finished product name because there already is one what you're saying is redundant at that point and it's only going to cloud the waters and and make things messy or like i like to do is have that i have that generic go to work and then i will replace the and and of course the the picture that brings on the behavior that's all part of the name so when you know in my example before when i put out the cone the witch's hat um, and I'm teaching the dog to go around it, the presence of that and me saying go to work means go around it, right? And then so like it, there's all these triggers that are there for it. Just let them do the work until you're finished, like you're really happy with the behavior and then you go, okay, now I'll put my name to it. And the name takes the maximum power, the maximum value and there's no confusion because like, you know, you, you like naming your behavior is classical conditioning. And so if your dog is still not quite sure on the behavior and you give it the name, at a state of confusion for him, that name can bring on confusion, right? Yeah. And so you see people like the dog's like, hmm, you said it. I think it means this. Well, I don't want to name it until my dog is like, I fucking know exactly what you want me to do, right? And then I say, okay, and doing that is called this. Right. Well, and you're taking the opera and turn it into classical. Exactly. Uh, but but exactly. now you're actually coming in there and influencing the situation. You don't want mm -hmm. your influence to draw away from the learned activity that we're trying to teach the dog. And so the learned yeah. activity has to have so much weight that your influence basically kind of puts a little sprig of parsley on it. <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not the, the yeah, main it's goal, there. right? Yeah. Like you already know what that's it right. is. And let me, let me just put a little thing here and just say, you're, you're right. Yeah. And, this and that's right. And people try to sort of influence the dog with the name and they kind of like with their body do the like, yeah, like, go do the thing yeah. right? and, and place and yeah exactly and so having a like as you say like it could be a bell like when you think about like ding the behavior should happen and your word has just got to be that because you know especially if you're going to go in competition or if the dog is going to live a real world where you want to be able to tell him what to do when he can't see you you have to distinguish between the fact that the dog knows the verbal command knows what he hears not just what he sees and if like if he's got the choice your dog's gonna much prefer to read your language in order to know, read your body language in order to know what to do rather than just hear your command if you give him the choice he's definitely going to want to read you yeah and i think so many people you see this in a lot of competition prep right like people you know i've got terrible posture you see me constantly trying to fix my back 12 yeah. years of wearing body armor will wreck anyone right yeah. but when i train my dog i intentionally like shoulders come back and i stand up straight because I know when I'm in competition, I'm going to be nervous and that's what's going to happen. We're outside of my control. That's going to happen. And you see a lot of people go into competition and like they haven't prepared for that and they stand up tall and they're freaking out and they tell their dog to heal and the dog goes, no, healing, you look a particular way. Yeah, you're like, you do not look that way right now. So I hear you saying it. I hear you saying it with your voice, but you ain't doing it with your body and your body means more to me. And then those same people will say, oh, you know, the dog blew me off or whatever. I say, no, you didn't give the command correctly, right? A picture of your command is your body. And in the heel, we kind of can't avoid that because the dog's looking right at us, right? So that's kind of part of it. But in your changes of position and your recall and your send away and all that kind of stuff, you need to be able to do that from within a blind where the dog can't see you. So you've got to be really careful to not make that part of the, the, the command for the dog. Because like I say, if he, he would much rather just read your body language than listen to what you say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how they learn from each other. They're not walking up to each other and be like, hey, dude, I'm going to go sniff these flowers over here. Just chill. I'll be back. You know, they just exactly. the dog like running fast, see a tail getting smaller and smaller. And they're like, oh, shit, there's <laughs> something interesting over there. You know, yeah. and that's that's basically how the dog sees the world where we, you and I can sit here perfectly still and convey a vast variety of abstract ideas and and talk about you know lots of different things without moving a muscle and yeah that's it for a dog yeah. we must be freaking just boring 
you know, and, and hard to pick well, one too, you know. It's knowing to isolate that, right? Like knowing being really careful to isolate, like if this is a behavior that I need on a strict verbal command is not giving away anything else. And, 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 and like I say, in most competition, there's an out of sight, component to that like in in psa in the level two in the change of position uh it's not necessarily out of sight but it will be weird they'll like because it's a you know it's, it's not a surprise scenario but the judge has a lot of, of um room for interpretation you will be in a weird position you're not just going to get to turn around and look at your dog and say sit down stand that that's not happening um like i think one of the times i did it i had to sit in a chair with my back to the dog right and so, and the second, yeah. So the first time I was sitting in a chair with my back to the dog and the second time I was in a car. So I had to get in a car and from within the car, yell out to the dog out the window. So if like, if part of your, your position is like, I look at you and then I say these things, it, it ain't happening. Um, and then similarly, we then in that game, we have to then recall the dog to that weird position to a heel. And he has to give his best like approximation of it because you're not in a standing straight up position which is part of most people's, you know, picture to the dog. This is what heel looks like. Right. So the dog has to then like what, that's one of the cool things I like about PSA is we kind of ask the dog sometimes to do things that are impossible to see what his best do. version of what he will do. And so, you know, on my second one, I was in a car and had to recall the dog to heel. So my dog like jumped on the bonnet and looked at me through the windscreen. Like <laughs> what? It's like, are you mad? Oh, yeah. What are you doing human? <laughs> yeah. But that was good. They were happy with that. They're like, it showed that he was trying. He understands. We couldn't complete the behavior. He, he did his best effort, right? Like yeah. good for him. And uh, like I got, you know, I think it's a five point exercise and I got four because it was impossible to do. I mean, he could have got in and come around with me. Yeah. The door was open, but he just came straight line and looked at it. And uh, that's a pretty good effort. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty good effort. Well, not only that, but we also have decoys out there that, I mean, some of them like to fuck up your dog, man. I've seen like, yeah. and some of them might the have a dog the out, there, you know, what's that? That's the point of it, right? That's right. the whole idea. The dog's got to learn to ignore, like, at the cost of everything else, to listen to you. Right. Well, and the people that think they have their dog locked in on that, why don't you stand in the bathroom, look in the mirror, and tell your dog to sit. And when they sit, tell them to sit again. And, and yeah, yeah. just sit there. You know, they should just sit yeah. there looking at you like an idiot. But watch what they do, man. I bet either they're going to, like, stand up and walk away. They're going to lay down. They're going to, you know, there's... Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of different things that, uh, you know, yeah, when I first started doing that, my dog would then like he was in a seat and I tell him to sit again before I started using that as a duration marker uh -huh. and his ass would pop up and then he'd slam it in again. Like, <laughs> Good boy. Like, like dude, yes, but it showed to him the criteria was putting your ass on the floor, okay. not having your ass on the floor. Okay, right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's diagnostic in that way. We go, oh, okay, that's what it means to you. Right. Because I told you to do it again. And we have to then change it. And that's why I started using the name of the behavior as my duration marker for that behavior. So while he's in a sit, I can say sit Absolutely. and then I can give him food in position. Yeah. Right? Makes sense. Well, dude, we're already 96 minutes into this no conversation. Shit. Yeah. But I would love, you know, I think we can go for another live some other time and I would love yeah, to have you back on and just to get, thanks for having me. Hopefully some people, um, well, got some I want interesting to, info out of it. How do people get a hold of you? That's what my big thing is. Is that, uh, uh yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the best thing to do, I think, is uh, jump on my website, operantcanine.com.au, and there's like a, a fill out a form there. That's my best way of getting back to people. Uh, like I don't, I don't want to brag, but I have a lot of unread messages from people that, you know, people send me private messages on Facebook, which is cool. And I, I try to get to everybody that I can, but a lot of it just gets buried and you don't, you know, you don't see it. Um, so if your email is usually the best way, because then I, I've got little folders and I can get back to stuff rather than it just disappearing in the, in the message ether. Well, and then what is your Patreon? I want to make sure to do a, a link there. And did you know what? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, I'm going to have, um, you know, I have the podcast you. that I do with uh, my good friend, Glenn Cook. Uh, it's called the canine paradigm. Um, it's, you know, we do a lot of interviews, a lot of us just talking shit um you know whatever we feel like right uh we're we're even branching into some non-dog topics um health and stuff like that uh which is cool and um, people are enjoying that but we also have a patreon through there so people can um donate to us to support the show you know um running a podcast is fairly expensive uh, which we had no idea about until we started doing it um and in order to incentivize people doing that we we put out an extra episode per month um and that's usually it's some some of them are me and glenn just talking about you know specific, it's educational content right so some of it's uh just audio um and then others is uh us in front of a camera doing um uh you know lessons on stuff what i really like about the patreon stuff is i 
Um, I go into crazy detail. It, it's it's for dog trainers, right? Or really dog training enthusiasts. I've I've shown some of the content to friends of mine who are you know not dog people, and they don't have a clue what I'm talking about, right? So it's the upper level stuff. It's very technical. Like I say, that stuff we're talking about on naming a behavior. There's a whole there's an hour long episode of me explaining how just how to name a behavior. So I really enjoy doing that stuff. It's the really technical stuff that even in seminars and workshops you don't get the time to go through in that extreme detail. And it can be hard to follow. So that's why I like to put that sort of stuff out there in video content where people can pause it and go back and and that kind of thing, right? So, uh, yeah, if you jump onto Patreon, we are The Canine Paradigm on there and um, you can support the show there. Three bucks a month gets people access to that episode. Ten bucks, we do a live Q&A um, about that episode. So we don't answer questions in there because it's a bit of a mess. So if you want to, like we do a live Q&A, you can ask questions and we answer it and we go through it all. Um, and, yeah, people can... If anyone wants to buy me a Lamborghini through there, they can do that as well, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yet, yet, yet. Well, and, and yeah. you're also doing, I want to, so I got a, I got a link up to Quadrant Canine. I got a link up with, um, to um, the- Quadrant Canine, yours is getting a plug. Is it Quadrant? No, did I just put up Quadrant? Operant canine. Did I put up Quadrant? No, Operant. I, I, put out, I put on Operant Canine. I don't know why I was put up quadrant. quadrant as well. Yeah, I'll put up quadrant. Go check out yours. Yeah. Good guy. I like it. <laughs> so operate canine, <laughs> fill out the contact form. Uh, Patreon.com, yeah, the, the Caradine Paradigm. Uh, par- car- canine Paradigm. Yeah. The Canine Paradigm. <laughs> the Paynine Caradigm. <laughs> I'm going to go smoke some weed right now. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the Paynine Care. The Paynine Care. I'm doing it again. Are you sure you haven't already? Is it when you went off camera there? Is that what was happening? No, man. I couldn't even deal with all these damn dogs if I was doing that. <laughs> um, Paradigm.com. But then you're also doing these seminars, man. And so let's, yeah. um, you, you've got a bunch, I think. Yeah. So in, uh, um, this weekend, I'm in Brisbane. Uh, I think there's a couple of spots left to that. People need to talk to Tammy Peters about that. I think there's a couple of spots. So um, jump onto that. Uh, end of the month, I'm in Tucson. Uh, it's all on my website as well if you're there. I think there's still spots in Tucson. I think there's 10 spots, I think she said, so that people can still get in on that. Um, what else has got availability in states? Oh, at uh, Stateline Canine in Hanover, Pennsylvania. People get in touch with Sean Edwards. He's booking that one. Um, speaking at the ICP conference this year on the box stuff, which uh, will be a, a really interactive uh, talk. So I'm going to talk about it and go through it and have some case studies and examples and that sort of thing for about an hour. Oh, yeah, box. the box. Look at that corner and then, all chewed up from my... Yeah, nice. Uh, and as we said, like the box, you know, there's lots of people that have learned that from Barton. Everybody has their own interpretation of it. So I'm going to be doing my interpretation of that. Uh, and I'll be going through it all in kind of agonizing detail for an hour and explaining it all and getting to people to understand how it works. And then we've got, I've got a two hour slot. So that'll mean we will actually get to do it with a lot of dogs. I think one of the things that's important with the box is that you see, you see it with a lot of dogs because it goes really differently. There's not like, this is how it should go, right? Like it with every dog at every different level, it will go really differently. And what is a terrible session for one dog might be a fantastic session for another. And you need to see and understand that. So I'm really excited about talking about that. Um, yeah, that's it. And what else have I got going on? Oh, later in the year. So I uh, haven't put out the details for this yet, but later in the year. So uh, in Australia, I'm doing uh, these week-long sort of immersion packages, kind of a, I call it a boot camp um, on the full spectrum of motivation, which is like, a, you know, an immersion in Nipopo for five days. Uh, so they're, the two in Australia are booked out, but I'm looking to do those in the States in November. And I've got three locations set up for that. It's going to be uh, West Coast, sort of then mid-South Texas and then over on the East Coast as well. And I'm sure that the guys hosting will go crazy pushing that around once we finalize everything for that. But that's going to be November. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned for all that. You're a busy man. Trying to be. And you got a kid and it, wife too. Yeah, that's right. Um, but, hey, look, I, I love doing this. I think I'm only a pretty good dog trainer. I'm, I'm, I'm What I am good at is teaching people. Um, and I think my – my passion and skill kind of lies in understanding why things work. And so, you know, I've surrounded myself by people who are exceptional at what they do and I like to investigate it and I can see why does what you do work. Um, and I'm pretty good then at sort of replicating it and then being able to pass on that information and, and teaching it. I love teaching people. I teach through a lot of story and that sort of thing. Um, I love doing it. People, people have been giving me pretty good feedback, so it's, it's working out. Um, and I, I, 
just it's crazy how lucky and fortunate I am to be in a position to do what I love day to day. So I don't mind working hard because it's 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 not really work when you love it, right? Right. Yeah. You get to play with dogs, you know. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Of course. Stay on one second and I will say goodbye to you uh, on the other side. And then uh, everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to share this and check out uh, the paint, the canine care (laughs) dive. The canine paradigm. (laughs) The canine paradigm, dude. I don't know what the hell is going on, but yeah, yeah. but thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back here shortly, everybody. See ya. See ya.